you. I was going to ask you if you were getting a little bit tired, but after Ben spoke, I am guessing you are all jazzed up. So actually, you really are incredible. Uh, uh, you have incredible staying power. And um, it's kind of appropriate that I should speak in this last session, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about a bacterium that also has incredible staying power. It's Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about our work to understand the basis of its staying power with the goal of designing better strategies to ultimately eliminate it. But first, I should do a better job of introducing myself. So I'm a microbiologist at Harvard, and I'm guessing that none of you actually really knows what a microbiologist does. So I wanted to share, show you what we wear to work. Cool, huh? And this is our perspective of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Beautiful, right? But it causes human tuberculosis. And though we have the privilege of ignoring tuberculosis in this country, tuberculosis remains an enormous global health problem. So just some numbers uh, to, to uh, put some scale to that. So it's estimated that there are about 15 million active cases of tuberculosis every year. Most of those are in India, Africa, and China. And it is also estimated that about a third of the world's population, that is 2 billion people, are latently infected with tuberculosis. That means they're infected, they carry the bacterium, but have not yet developed active disease. Now, that number isn't quite as horrifying as it seems, because only about 1 in 10 of them is going to develop disease in the absence of HIV. But it does serve to highlight some really basic facts about TB. Okay, first, TB is a really successful pathogen. And the key to its success is that it's really hard to get rid of. So it is hard to eliminate, obviously, on a global scale, but it is actually also hard to eliminate on an individual scale. So if I have active tuberculosis, I would be treated with antibiotics, four antibiotics, for six months, maybe 12, if I had HIV. You know, if you have strep throat, you get maybe a week of antibiotics. This is a whole different scale of a problem. And that, uh, that, that paradigm actually is replicated in the lab, because just as TB is hard to eliminate in an individual, TB is really hard to kill in the lab. So I'm going to show you some totally imaginary data from an experiment that we do all the time, where we take a population of bacteria and we try to kill it. And we try to kill it with something that either your body or your doctor is going to use to try to kill TB. And what you see is we can always kill most of the bacteria, but there are always a few bacteria that remain. And so when we relieve that stress, that bacterial population can rebound, and if it's in an individual, cause disease again. So why? Why does this happen? And our model for why this happened actually builds on a lot of ideas that you've already heard many times in this conference, applied to different systems at different scales. But they have to do with the idea that variability both choreographed variability and variability that arises because of noise, stochastic variation, creates robustness in a population. So our model is really very simple. TB is designed to vary, and that variation creates resilience in the bacterial population. So I, we started thinking about bacterial variation when we started looking at mycobacteria. So this is a field of mycobacteria, and we stain different parts of it red and green. But each of one of those lozenge-shaped things is a mycobacterium. And we were so proud of ourselves. We were like, oh my god, they're beautiful. And so then you know, we're at Harvard. We're a little competitive. And so the next thing we said was, well, how do our bacteria stack up? Um, and so we went on the web and uh, looked around at other kinds of bacteria and tried to see what they'd look like. And so this was one of the first images that we pulled up. This is E. coli. It's another bacterium. It doesn't cause disease, at least not very often. And OK, on the attractiveness scale, this guy gets a 10. It is beautiful, right? But um, once we got over that, uh, we noticed, wow, all of those cells look really similar to one another. And our mycobacteria may not be so high on the attractiveness scale, but wow, all of those cells are really different from one another. Uh, 
And so then we began to look at variability and in more depth, and we discovered that mycobacteria have multiple mechanisms, not just genetic mechanisms, but multiple mechanisms to generate variation across a range of um, rates uh, and with a range of durabilities that creates a whole tapestry of variation in that bacterial population that ensures that whatever the circumstance that bacterium faces, there's always somebody who's going to survive. And so instead of going into the mechanisms of that, what I really wanted to show you was variability in action, because this is just, you know, phenotypic variation. What I wanted to show you was a simple example of variability in a very basic physiologic property in growth. So I'm going to show you, and I hope you can see that, um, a video micrograph of mycobacterium growing in a microfluidics device. And what you're going to see is these are two channels in a microfluidics device, each one of which starts out with two mycobacterial cells. And then as they grow, little blue dots are going to appear. Those are little fluorescent proteins we use to mark the end of the cells. Let's see how it goes. So here they start. And I want you to notice something really simple. The guys on the right are doing a lot better than the guys on the left. And so in the course of a few generations, whoops, hello. In the course of a few generations, there are about three times as many cells on the right as on the left. So you can imagine that there are times when it's good to be a grower, when you're infecting a new patient or a new person, for example. But there are times when the going gets really tough, say in the face of antibiotic treatment, when the fact that the population has um, ensured that there's some slow growers there means that that population will survive. Okay. So now I've come to my, uh, you know, think global, act local uh, moment. I want to ask for your advice because I have a problem. So to test these models, what we do is we follow individual bacterial cells and we measure them. We measure them by hand because actually image tracking can't do this. We watch them grow, we try to kill them, and then we relieve that pressure and watch them grow again. And our rate limiting step in research is the ability of our eyes to track bacterial cells. And so we would like to engage lots of eyes in that process. And if you have ideas about how we could do that, either through crowdsourcing or uh, distributive labor, or, or if you could think of a way to make TB tracking really cool and sexy and compelling, please email me. And thank you very much.